Welcome to Cannabis 360, your source for cannabis and psychedelic industry news, interviews, and insights. Visit Canna360.ca and sign up to receive free access to the entire Cannabis 360 catalog. In this episode of High Fidelity, we speak with Alana Goldberg, co-founder and CEO of The Kenigma. Alana discusses how she started The Kenigma, the importance of fact-based education, and the current state of scientific research when it comes to cannabis. Okay. Hi, Alana. How are you today? I'm good, Kana. Good to see you. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, really nice to see you as well. Thank you for joining us today. Really excited to talk to you and to uh, go over the Kenigma and uh, your background in the industry um, and just sort of what you're all about. So I just wanted to start off. Can you tell me yeah, a little bit about your background and what led you to the cannabis industry in the first place? Yeah, sure, definitely. Um, so I'm Australian, as you can probably hear from my accent, um, but I'm based in Israel. I've been here for about 15 years now. Um, and my, my career up until now, including what I'm doing at the Kenigma, has always been based around digital content creation. Um, I started off as a breaking news editor at the Jerusalem Post, which is the biggest English language newspaper here in Israel. Um, and that was really where I started to get a taste for how much I enjoyed putting the written word out there and just seeing how people react. Um, seeing how people engage with content, um, understanding what types of headlines draw clicks, what kind of topics are most interesting to people. Um, so it was a really great start to be working on a website like that. I ended up managing the website for a few years there um, before moving on to helping build some websites in both the nonprofit space and also very much in the commercial space, working for an Israeli uh, performance marketing company called Natural Intelligence. And that was where I kind of learned how the internet really works. Like, you know, the money side of things, digital advertising. Um, so I kind of like picked up a bunch of different things along the way. And I was really looking for somewhere where I could take all of this understanding of digital content and do something with it that mattered. You know, I didn't feel like I was doing something bad for the world necessarily working in, in uh, online marketing, but I didn't feel like I was doing something good, you know, really making a difference. And so when I ended up uh, connecting with the other founders of the Kenigma who had this idea of putting together some sort of educational platform Form portal in the cannabis space, I was like, yeah, this is it. Um, so we started off with this idea, um, basically based on an understanding that there was really questionable uh, information available about cannabis and also obviously understanding that there's more and more kind of new countries, new states uh, coming online in the cannabis space, whether it's medical or recreational, I mean, almost every week at this point. So understanding this information is going to be relevant and useful to more and more people kind of uh, seeing that opportunity. Um, so when we started building the site at first, we were thinking really medical. Um, so we started off kind of building out this core um, of like the content library, which is now the Kenigma. And what we understood as we were building it was that it doesn't really matter whether you're kind of uh, using it for medical purposes or using it for recreational purposes. If the question you have is something like, I don't know, like, why does cannabis make my eyes red, right? It's like, this is just what the science says. It doesn't matter what the use case is. And that's really to put aside the fact that I don't really believe there's any such thing as recreational use. I think all cannabis use ends up being uh, therapeutic, if not medicinal, um, in some way. So at that point, with that understanding, we kind of started expanding the scope of the Kenigma to target all patients and consumers um, with this really strong kind of evidence-based science indicated approach. Um, so that's kind of what the Kenigma is today. It's the go-to uh, site where we, you know, we're building it into being the go-to site for any practical or theoretical cannabis question. Um, users can come to the site and uh, look at articles, listen to podcasts, watch videos. Um, there are a lot of infographics that kind of support the information um, on the site. And uh, yeah, growing the audience every day. We're reaching about half a million uh, people a month all around the world, which is super cool. And uh, yeah, I guess that's kind of the story more or less. No, I love it. And I want to get to, to that part that you mentioned, which is sort of all of the misinformation that, that, that mm -hmm. is out there around cannabis. But before that, you mentioned your background in journalism. So how do you feel that that sort of impacts your approach in terms of the content that you highlight on the Kenigma? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would even go so far as to say it's not, it doesn't influence my approach, it is um, the approach, you know? It's about bringing information to the public. And 
a lot of what we do is kind of like, I look at it as translating, you know, we're translating the science into language that anyone can understand. And so that approach really kind of um, pulls through our topic selection, the way we review content, the way we even kind of sketch out any content um, that we put up on the site that we want to, you know, have a clear unbiased approach. Um, I really believe that we're not doing cannabis any favors by pretending that it is a panacea, that it can fix every different problem, uh, you know, that, that anyone uh, could experience. Um, so even when there's information about cannabis, which is not necessarily flattering, we see that that's, um, you know, our place to put it out there as well. And I think that, you know, is very much in line with editorial and journalistic values. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I do even want to touch on that a little bit more, but you know, we do hear about this sort of abundance of, of misinformation. And a lot of the times we, we blame that on prohibition and just really a general lack of, of quality research out there. So how would you sort of describe the current state of, of cannabis research globally? Um, and, you know, you being in Israel, which, which we sort of know as, as the hotspot and, and the, the epicenter of, of high quality cannabis research. So, you know, have we made significant progress in that area um, or is there still you know a really long way to go yes yeah, so there's I mean there's a bunch of parts of that question I want to kind of pull it apart a bit so first of all you mentioned that you know the lack of information or the lack of quality information is connected with prohibition and I think that's really true you know we we, we tend to think about how prohibition limited access you know safe legal access to the plant but it really limited our access to information as well because of exactly what you said that the research just wasn't taking place or at least not at the kind of uh the same frequency as, as researching other similar substances you know uh whether it be other illicit substances or or you know legal substances pharmaceuticals are a really good example um and so we're, we're kind of playing catch up at this point. And so I think part of, you know, this misinformation comes down to lack of information or a historical lack of information. And part of it comes down to real misunderstandings about science and about scientific method, you know? Um, we sometimes get feedback on content that we'll put out there. I don't know, let's say we put something out saying that there's research that shows that cannabis does uh, impact sperm count. And then you'll have all these people that are saying, what are you talking about? I've got 20 children. I've been smoking pot since I was three. It can't be that this is true. And it's like, wait, but you've got to understand what this research means. It means that there is a higher chance of this happening. It means that, you know, you might see this in 60% of patients, whatever it is. So I think a lot of times we end up with misinformation from publications that are trying to, you know, bring the science um, to the, the lay audience, just like we are but not having a proper understanding of how to actually interpret um, that scientific research or the scientific literature. And that's really where our scientific advisory board comes in. I do not have a scientific background. I think I'm pretty well versed in it all from, you know, creating this content for a few years with the team, but I'm not a scientist. I'm not a researcher. I'm not a pharmacologist. So that's why we really pulled together this board of scientific advisors headed up by our chief science officer, Dr. Cody Peterson, who's a pharmacist himself. Um, and we have experts really across the board. We have uh, practicing clinicians, we have researchers, we even have a legal expert and a culinary expert, Jordan Wagman, who we were just speaking about. Um, and so really any piece of content we create before we even start writing the article, we put together a brief and we consult with the appropriate um, expert there to make sure that we're on the right track, to make, the, to make sure that we've got all of the, you know, the appropriate reference material in there. Um, and that's how we keep the standard up. But it's, you know, this is... Uh, a rigorous process. It's not cheap to create this kind of content and, and not everyone can do it. So I think that's, you know, a lot of what's, you know, when I look at how we manage, I hope not to be putting out any misinformation, I see that, you know, probably anyone who's not going through a process like that is going to end up, uh, you know, making these mistakes, reporting on studies, which really <laughs> need another 20 studies to go with them to make it into a rich body of evidence and to actually say something about the plan. Um, I think another big factor in there, and this goes back to the prohibition story, is that because there was no research or no quality information during the time of prohibition, and in some ways you could say we're still in a global sense, at least we're still in prohibition, um, but because there was such a lack of information and yet cannabis use continued and there was, you know, a real thriving uh, illicit market, 
there was a need for categorization. So we did things like we started to use categorization like indica and sativa because we didn't have much better at that point. Um, and even though the science has shown that whether or not a plant has, has kind of uh, roots literally and figuratively in indica or sativa is not a really good indication of what effect um, a cannabis product coming from those flowers is going to have. Um, it was the best we had right then. So I think a lot of the work we're doing now is kind of like rolling back um, the, the language and the classification systems that we built during the prohibition era so that we can be more accurate and ultimately so that, you know, consumers can make better kind of purchase choices um, and, and have better cannabis experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so is part of that, do you think sort of that, that confusion in terms of the scientific method around like, correlation versus causation yeah I think it's probably part of it that kind of falls into what I was saying before of just not understanding science properly like just because there is a connection like you said doesn't necessarily mean it's a cause I mean you see that a lot when you're looking at uh, mental health issues now is it does cannabis cause mental health issues or is it that people with mental health in issues have a tendency to use cannabis probably because they're kind of self-medicating as I was mentioning before mm -hmm. Yeah, or a genetic predisposition and, mm -hmm, and that sure. having a factor. So, but in terms of where we are now, do are we getting better? You know, since countries have legalized, I know, you know, here in Canada, we are seeing progress on that front and, and more research being funded around cannabis. So, you know, is it getting better or, you know, what what type of pitfalls are we still sort of facing on the research side? Yeah, it's definitely getting better. I mean, you mentioned before that Israel is this kind of hub of medical cannabis research, and it still is, but there's more and more research coming out from different countries around the world. You know, Canada's a nice example, but, you know, gold standard scientific research is really expensive. You know, it can it cost like $50 million to research one molecule, which of course is not useful when it comes to cannabis, because we're looking at a whole plant product with dozens, hundreds of different uh, active molecules in any product. So it's even more expensive there, but even, you know, the, the funding that's required to test one molecule for one purpose, right, which is generally what you're doing in the pharmaceutical space and in the kind of traditional Western medicine space. Um, so it's really difficult to get the money um, to fund that sort of research, even though we need it, for sure we need it, if not for kind of uh, adult use or recreational consumption, definitely in the medical space. Um, but it's getting better. And I think a, a, another difference that we see compared to, you know, as a another difference that we see apart from just like the amount of research is the type of research that's being done. So we're seeing more and more research, which is being done on specific cannabinoids uh, instead of just saying like, you know, we gave this amount of respondents cannabis because what does that even mean, you know? And then also the purpose of the research, you know, the majority of the research that, that was carried out during the prohibition era, era was uh, with the aim of proving how terrible cannabis was and how dangerous and how, uh, how unsafe it was. Of course, it wasn't successful, <laughs> um, most of that research, but it means that it was difficult to use the findings there because the purpose of the research was not to, you know, find out all of the different therapeutic properties of the plant. So that's definitely changing. And in terms of the kind of product classification and naming systems, we're getting there. Um, I'm seeing a trend that's kind of moving towards uh, what I would call sensation-based naming. So like, you know, this is focus, it's for uplifting, it's for relaxation. And that's really what consumers need to know, you know, like what is this going to do to me? What can I expect from this? And it, it's really like, uh, such a weird phenomenon in the cannabis space that we can end up like giving someone a product and and it, this could you know end up with you stuck on the couch for three hours or you could be cleaning your house for three hours and it's really important to know the difference like imagine if someone was a, a, a pharmacist gave you a bottle of Tylenol and was like this might help your headache or it might you know relax all of your muscles <laughs> it's not really very useful um, so we're getting that for sure and I think Canada's another good example where um, it's been like, what, three, four years now um, since, since legalization across the board. And so we're really only starting to see changes now. We need some more time to see what the impacts are of, of federal legalization on different states and markets. Yeah, there's sort of this wild card factor with uh, cannabis that it's like it affects everyone differently. So <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And then 
I, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, you mentioned sort of the gold standard of research, and and you know, from my understanding, it's sort of you know the double blind placebo controlled trial. Exactly. And now, are yeah. are sort of psychoactive substances in general, not necessarily just cannabis, but you know, we're talking about cannabis right now. Are are these sort of infamously difficult to design double blind placebo controlled trials around just because of their psychoactive nature? Yeah, I, I've heard of a whole lot of different ways of getting around this. There's also, I would add to it, it's not just the psychoactivity or maybe the psychotropic nature is, is, is kind of more the point, what we're talking about here, because CBD is psychoactive, but, you know, not intoxicating or impairing. Um, another challenge is, is what you do with whole plant products. You know, it's more difficult to give someone something to smoke, which isn't actually cannabis, um, and for them to think that it's cannabis than it is to just give them a sugar pill. You know, so there are definitely challenges there. Um, but I think, you know, there's, there's enough impairing and intoxicating substances which have been gone through, you know, these, these kind of placebo uh, controlled double blind trials that I think basically the scientific community knows how to get around these things. Okay, interesting. So you mentioned it um, a little bit earlier, and I think it's a really important point, something that I stress as well. And it's, it's sort of this idea that, that cannabis isn't benign, right? Mm -hmm. And so how, how important is it to really admit that we don't know everything about cannabis, but also that includes the potential harms of it as well. And although there, there might have been sort of this abundance of, of research or focus in the research around that during the prohibition era, but you know, there, there still might be things out there that we need to find out um, in terms of those potential harms. Maybe. I mean, I, I feel like we uh, kind of as a scientific community, the medical community, as well as the cannabis community, I think we can be pretty comfortable in saying that this is a very safe substance. Um, and, for, and I think that's a good reason, for example, for it to be used as a first line treatment rather than a last resort treatment, which is what it's often, uh, often physicians are required to, to try a number of different treatments before they try cannabis. And I think the safety profile I think it's pretty well proven. You know, there's never been a recorded death from cannabis. Like it's been used for thousands of years. Shouldn't that be enough? You know, like we should, we could, should definitely look into places where there's some sort of indication that we should be looking for harm, uh, you know, mental health, specifically psychosis and bipolar. We should be looking into these things. But also I think we can tell physicians and other healthcare providers Look, as long as you know that there's no family history or personal history of psychosis, of, uh, you know, these, these serious psychiatric disorders, you can feel pretty comfortable giving it to a patient. And worst case scenario, they're going to have a bit of a rough night if they take, you know, a couple too many drops, but they're going to be fine in a few hours. And look, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, but I feel, feel pretty comfortable in, in kind of stating the safety profile of this, of this plan. Okay. Now... I want to first touch on sort of legislators and, and regulators and why I like the Conigma so much is what you mentioned at the at the start, which is sort of the, the focus on education that you have. So why is it so important for legislators and regulators to be educated on cannabis and sort of what are the basic points that you think they they really just need to understand first? Great question. So, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious why it's so important. These are the people that are going to be making the laws, which are going to end up being implemented and becoming, uh, you know, cannabis programs in whatever shape and form. And the more misinformation there is amongst the people making these laws, the more we're going to end up with, you know, various different problematic systems that we can see around the world, which, you know, started off with the best of intentions, but can't be implemented in such a way that it allows access to the plant to the people who need it or want it for that uh, matter. Um, so I, I think, you know, the, the need for that education is pretty clear. What do they need to know? So to me, there are three main points. Number one is there are many different types of cannabis. I think this is something which if people can really get this into their heads, it changes everything. The fact that there are types of cannabis which aren't necessarily going to get you high or definitely won't get you high means that, you know, the plant falls into kind of a different category, different, uh, you know, mindset uh, when people are thinking about this. So that's number one, you know, having an in-depth understanding of type one, type two, type three cannabis, as in high THC, balanced, 
low T, low, sorry, high CBD, low THC cannabis, that'd be great. But even just the understanding that there are different types of cannabis that has different effects and varying levels of that, you know, psychotropic or impairing uh, properties that we talked about before. So that's number one. Number two is that dose is incredibly important. And I think this kind of fixes up, you know, everyone has that story of the time that them and their friends decided to make hash cookies or whatever. They ate one hash cookie and they did not have an enjoyable time. And so therefore I don't like cannabis. Um, I think a little bit of an understanding of the, the kind of dose dependent effects of cannabis would really help out there. Um, and again, so the next level, like it'd be nice if we just understood, okay, dose is important. And even more so if they're to understand that at a low dose, cannabis can actually have a, a the opposite effect than at a high dose. And this is something that probably makes sense to anyone. And by the way, it's not just cannabis. Alcohol is exactly the same, that at a low dose, you know, one drink, you're, you're, you know, really nice and relaxed and sociable, drink the whole bottle and you're probably not going to be the most sociable guy in the room. Everyone's, you know, not going to want to hang out with you. So the same with cannabis, you know, at a low dose, it can be an anti-nauseant. At a high dose, you end up greening out. At a low dose, it can really help with anxiety. At a high dose, it can actually trigger anxiety. So that sort of understanding of the importance of dose is the second thing that I would really like. Well, actually everyone to understand, but for legislators, I think it's super important there. Um, so to understand that it can be a very safe substance, what well, is, as we said before, a very safe substance, but um, even more of like a, a kind of um, therapeutic substance at the appropriate dose. That's number two. And then number three is the endocannabinoid system. Um, I think that, you know, if all legislators understood that we have a system in the body which cannabis directly interacts with and that this system regulates a number of important functions in the body, like sleep, reproduction, memory, temperature control. And what I think this knowledge does is it explains why cannabis can be useful for such a, a plethora of different uh, symptoms and conditions. Because I think there's this kind of, stigma that yeah people who are using medical cannabis don't not really using it as a medicine they just want to get high kind of thing because like how can it be that it helps Parkinson's and it helps depression and it helps sleep and how can this be and the endocannabinoid system is how it can be um so yeah if I had my way and you know I could speak to every healthcare provider and and legislator and bud tender by the way around the world and get these three pieces of information out there I think uh, I think we'd be in a much better place and that's what we're doing. Well, that's what we're trying to do. Absolutely. And is there anything you would add? Uh, we were talking about sort of regulators there, but and, but you mentioned healthcare professionals. Is there anything you would mm. add that is sort of different or, you know, like in addition to it, when it comes to healthcare professionals and their understanding of cannabis? Yeah, so definitely I would, you know, include those three base points. Maybe some sort of understanding of like consumption methods, delivery methods um, would be useful there to understand that, you know, for patients with GI issues, maybe inhalation is preferable, um, that there are many ways to consume cannabis that do not involve combustion or that, you know, don't even use uh, inhalation. Um, so it's kind of like just understanding the products and, and uh, consumption methods there, I think would be really useful for healthcare providers across the board. And then, you know, some sort of understanding of the products available uh, where they're prescribing or where they're treating, um, because the more guidance patients can get from their prescribing physician or from the pharmacist um, or, or even, you know, a bud tender if they're, if they're buying from a dispensary, the more guidance they can get there, the higher the chance. You know, you mentioned before we're all different and we all react differently, and that's true to an extent, you know. There's, there's only a certain amount of, of variance there. And I think what we can do by guiding patients towards the right products is just shorten that trial and error period, which is probably necessary for all uh, new cannabis consumers, but it'd be great if they didn't have to go through 10 different products until they find, found the one that, that you know, helped their symptoms. Absolutely. And I guess finally, for someone that is new to cannabis and interested in learning more about it, where do you think is the, the best place to start really? Well, the Kenigma, obviously. Um, so that's Kenigma.com. Uh, we've got a few guides there which are really geared towards um, beginning cannabis users, often going over those exact points that we just went through. Um, there's some videos as well. You can check out our YouTube channel. Um, but basically, I would say 
Um, it's worth speaking to a consultant, some sort of, you know, whether it's a, a doctor or a nurse or a, there's many different cannabis consultants, you can just Google it. Um, but you don't have to. I think, you know, if, if you're the type of person that does like doing your own research, like a bit of an autodidact, I think, you know, a few hours of online research and you can go and start, you know, trying uh, cannabis products and see what works for you. Um, definitely just remember, start low and go slow. I think that's the key for any new user. Like, Worst case scenario, you're going to be still suffering with a symptom today because you took too low a dose, but you can always take more. It's pretty difficult to take less once you've already done that. Always sage advice. Absolutely. And yeah. uh, any, anything new and exciting happening over at the Connecticut? I know you guys are always working on, you know, cool, interesting new, new projects. So, so anything that, um, that you can give a shout out to here that, that you guys have going on? Yeah, definitely. So uh, we just launched our cannabis cookbook uh, in collaboration with Chef Jordan Wagman. Um, so that's available on the website, a bunch of different places. You shouldn't have a problem finding it there. Um, it's filled with basic recipes uh, for anyone kind of wanting to start off in the kitchen. Um, and then some really fun things like cannabis cocktails, a lot of sweets. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in there and, it, and it's quite beautiful if I don't say so myself. So that's a free download. Anyone can go get that. Um, the next uh, such ebook that we're working on is going to be our grow guide, our cultivation guide. Um, so we're starting to cook that up. Um, it'll probably be available in about three months' time. And I guess the other thing we're really excited about is that we just opened up a Patreon page. Are you familiar with Patreon? I am, yeah. Yeah, so we've got um, a few patrons already. Thank you if anyone's uh, watching for joining us and supporting us. Um, so we've got a whole lot of kind of uh, exclusive benefits for our patrons on there, like uh, Q&As with our scientific advisory team that I mentioned before, behind the scenes content, the ability to actually request content, kind of commission different topics for us to write on. So we're, we're kind of excited to start building that community. And uh, yeah, probably about a bunch of other things I'm forgetting, but those are the main kind of focuses for us over the next few months. That's so cool. With the Patreon, great idea. And we'll we'll link the um, the cookbook down below for everyone to download. I'm a big foodie, so um, I was really excited when when I heard that announcement and uh, and checked it Did out. You see it? It looks, yeah, yeah, it looks like some great recipes in there. And I love the addition of the cocktails too. That's super cool. So um, yeah. love it. Thank you so much, Alana. I really, really appreciate it. Um, thank you for going over the Kenigma. Highly suggest everyone go check it out. Lots of great information. Like you said, the strong focus on education there, which I think is so important. So thanks again for joining us today. Sure, thanks for having me. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of High Fidelity. For access to the entire Cannabis 360 catalog, subscribe at canna360.ca or visit our YouTube channel, Canna360.